the 80s, but he's been picking up Best Guitarist Awards in Jazz Pulse for about 10 years, ever since he joined the celebrated uh, Gary Burton Quartet at the tender age of 19. He was in London during the summer recording the soundtrack music for a new film called The Falcon and the Snowman, the theme of which is going to be sung by David Bowie. And uh, I found him in a little studio just off Baker Street, surrounded by the electronic paraphernalia of the travelling composer. But first, here he is in Montreal, the only guitarist who I would allow to play this quickly, Pat Metheny. I started playing when I was about 14, and I started working gigs around Kansas City, which was the nearest city to where I grew up. What, what was the first tune you played? Was it Louie Louie, or was it... Uh... Well, yeah, the very first tune would have been Louie Louie, and then, uh, you know, I mean, I'm also a product of that whole, you know, I mean, I saw Hard Day's Night 15 times when I was about 11 years old, and I mean, that was what first got me interested in the guitar, but I almost immediately went from that to listening to Miles and Ornette Coleman and Coltrane and people like that when I was like 13 and 14. That, that's pretty precocious listening, really, isn't it, for a 13, 14 year old? You weren't a snob at all at the time. You didn't oh, think yeah. It, you thought it was clever. No, no. I mean, you know, the thing is, it's like, I think that the whole thing of rock being a rebellious kind of thing is true, but I mean, my thing was I was not only interested in rebelling against my parents, I was also interested in rebelling against everyone else my age. Mm -hmm. And jazz seemed to be the perfect, uh, perfect way to, to express that. I mean, at this point, my, my level of uh, involvement to jazz is much more than just r rebelling against anything. I mean, uh, as you know, a few years went by, uh, I got involved in the jazz community around Kansas City. And, saw it more for the incredible tradition that, that it is. And uh, I mean, you know, I have to say my main love is playing like, you know, jazz standards and, and that sort of thing. You joined the ECM label very early on in your career, and they're a German-based label, rather interesting sort of jazz label. Um, you've stayed with them a long time. Yeah, it's just about 10 years now. Uh, what, what is it particularly about them that suits you? Well, it's uh, a sense that their number one priority is the music, which I have to say is another thing about the jazz community that appeals to me more than, than any other style. I mean, in pop music, it often seems that the priority is, you know, more on the way you look or the way you move or the way you act or what you say or what the contents of your lyrics are or your whole stage persona. The music is sometimes fourth or fifth on the priority list, and for me, I like music. I mean, I like hearing people who can play, play, and I like hearing people who can sing, sing, and really do it. And with ECM, every single person on the label can play. And, and the whole thrust of the label is to present this music that we all really like. Do you actually sell any records? We do, I think, real well by jazz standards. In fact, I think in the jazz world, we're considered, you know, like, uh, exceptionally successful. 
On the other hand, I mean, if we were a rock and roll band, I mean, we'd probably be dropped by nine or ten labels by now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's like if you sell several hundred thousand records in the jazz community, I mean, people think you're, like, gigantic, you know. Do you ever get played on the radio in the States? We have um, pockets where we get played all the time, and, and uh, it's interesting to see in our touring schedule how the radio play affects everything. Uh, an interesting example, down in Florida, there's a town called Tampa, you know, several hundred thousand people live there. There's a rock station, the biggest rock station, that plays our music all the time. Uh, we can go there, sell out two shows weeks in advance in a, in a 2,000 seat hall. Uh, we're, you know, big news when we come to town and stuff. Down the road, 50 miles, there's a, another town called Orlando, where Disney World is, maybe y'all have heard of that. And uh, they have not only no rock station that would play us, but n not even a college jazz station, nothing. Uh, we'd be lucky to draw 50 people there, and that's down the road a ways. Tell me, what are you actually doing in London? You're, you're working on a, on a soundtrack. Yeah, we're doing the score for uh, John Schlesinger's new film, The Falcon and the Snowman, which stars Timothy Hutton and Sean Penn. Now, you're, you're surrounded here by equipment that seems like a cross between musical stuff and something you might find behind the counter in a bank. Um, <laughs> you're checking your balance. Yeah. Well, what does this stuff do? I mean, what are you doing here? Are you recording or rehearsing or, or writing or what? At this stage of the game, we're about three weeks away from the beginning of the official recording of the score. So Lyle Mays, my writing partner, and I are here. Lyle's in another room down the hall here. We're both, at this point, just coming up with the basic themes, the beginnings of timings for the cues and everything. So you have a video of the film. We have so a video that we look on back here. And they tell you which bits they want music for. Exactly. And then what all this other stuff does is that it's kind of like... Um, it's sort of like the invention of the electric typewriter for a, a writer. This is the same for a musician. It allows me to, to do 16 tracks of, uh, of recording within the guitar and the keyboard and then kind of hear all the parts together and say, well, I want to change that or it should be a little faster, it should be a little slower, that kind of stuff. And it allows you to do it very quickly. To and, demonstrate. Uh, well, first, maybe I'll just play a few sounds that it can make. I mean. For me, obviously, being a guitar player, one of the exciting things is just that now, all of a sudden, I can get all these wild sounds from the guitar instead of from a keyboard. Like a trombone. Uh, like, here's a harmonica. Like Stevie Wonder or yeah. Peyton on that yeah. one. Yeah, like a vibraphone or... So, so what do you do? You put it, you program it into the... Um, I'm probably using all the wrong terms, but never mind. Yeah, you basically, you can record a bunch of things, and then if you want to see it written out, it'll write it out for you. So it'll actually write the music? Uh-huh. Well, no, I should say that. It'll copy what, what you you've played 
and then translate that into musician terms. So you could then pass it on to a, a session man who could yeah. play more or less exactly what you transpose it for did. him and everything. Can we see that? Yeah, it's going to take me a second just to put in a new disc here. Presumably you've had to learn a lot about this kind of equipment recently. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a computer kind of guy at all. And uh, they give you a real hefty manual that uh, you just go through it until you know, you understand it and then keep referring back to it. And it's designed for people who are not uh, computer types. You know? So I'll do this from the keyboard, it's just a little easier. I'll just play in a three-part thing, a bass part, a chords, and, and a harmonica, mm -hmm. and then I'll have it printed out. Very simplistic music here. It'll do. Okay, on track one, I had the bass part. When I printed out in bass clef, I know I didn't play anything smaller than an eighth note, so I tell it that. I go to track two. Punch in track two. That's where I played the chords. Yeah, and that's where I had the melody. That's on track three. It actually displays and now it's writing out what I play. And so it's, I... it's, a, it's a machine that, to a large extent, saves you time. Yeah, I mean, you know, it doesn't, it won't come up with the goods for you. I mean, like before when I was demonstrating the sound, I made a big clam, you know, where I kind of made a goof. And it, it's going to write out that goof in big letters. And you can, <laughs> say, you can see, well, gee, I made a goof there. It doesn't fix anything, but it'll help you, you know, see quickly what you've got and then change things.